Years ago, during our deep immersion in the world of Pokemon, an incident occurred that, while not objectively the scariest story you've ever heard, remains one of the most unnerving experiences of my life. It's a tale that still leaves me incredulous about the depths of human cruelty. At the time, our passion for Pokemon, particularly the games, knew no bounds. We played competitively, and the newly released Pokemon Sun and Moon had us captivated. When we got wind of a gaming event coming to our hometown, featuring Sun and Moon and rumors of a competitive battle tournament, we couldn't resist the lure of the opportunity. As the event date approached, our excitement reached a fever pitch. We held tickets in hand, dreams of victory in our hearts. However, our enthusiasm was soon punctured by a bitter reality, qualification for the tournament was a prerequisite, a feat we had not achieved. Yet, undeterred, we resolved to attend. The event itself unfolded as a whirlwind of joy. We spent the day snapping pictures, forging bonds with fellow Pokemon enthusiasts, and watching electrifying battles in the bustling convention hall. But then, as the clock neared 4 p.m., the day took a sinister turn. A man, appearing as an official with his khakis and polo shirt, donning a laminated badge, approached me. He carried an air of confidence and professionalism that seemed out of place amid our crowd of enthusiasts. He struck up a conversation, commending our shared passion for Pokemon. Overwhelmed with excitement, I readily affirmed our devotion. What followed was beyond our wildest imagination. The man claimed to work for Nintendo and unveiled plans for a groundbreaking battle mechanic in an upcoming Pokemon game. He needed testers, and, sensing our enthusiasm, he extended a mind-boggling opportunity. It left my friends and me nearly speechless. One friend, in particular, nearly danced with glee, treating this encounter as a stroke of luck akin to winning the lottery. The man stressed the utmost need for secrecy, emphasizing that the game hadn't even been officially announced yet. He provided an address for a clandestine meeting later that evening, promising non-disclosure agreements and the presence of a secretary to formalize our participation. In our youthful naivety, we were blinded by excitement, neglecting to question the legitimacy of this enigmatic encounter. The mere mention of non-disclosure agreements lent an aura of credibility to the man's proposition, momentarily obscuring the potential dangers. As night fell, we arrived at the specified address, a desolate building with a faded, antiquated furniture store sign, hinting at a long-abandoned past. We hesitated at the entrance, acknowledging the strangeness of the situation. But we rationalized the secrecy required for such a significant test, pointing to the presence of other cars in the parking lot as evidence of authenticity. Against our better judgment, we ventured forth, only to find the door locked. Despite our earnest knocks, no response came. Gazing through the grimy glass, we glimpsed a dark and forsaken warehouse within. One of my friends whispered that we should leave, but our collective desire for this to be real overrode his concerns. We convinced ourselves that the nature of the test demanded such a secure, clandestine location. The man's failure to provide his name or a business card didn't raise alarms, not at that moment, at least. Then, as if out of a nightmare, the overhead door of the warehouse began to creak open. It revealed a frail-looking woman who motioned us inside. Her unkempt appearance, with greasy hair and tattered clothing, sent shivers down our spines. Most disconcerting of all was her unsteady sway, as though she struggled to maintain her balance. Reluctantly, we approached her, but I stole a glance back through the door's window. In the eerie glow of a nearby streetlight, I spotted two shadowy figures crouched beside the overhead door, individuals who had been concealed earlier but were now brought into stark relief. Without uttering a word, 
I signaled to my friends that we needed to escape immediately. Pretending we had forgotten something in the car, we retraced our steps. The woman's attempts at communication were a jumble of incomprehensible sounds. As we neared our vehicle, the sound of multiple footsteps echoed behind us. Swinging around, we saw the woman flanked by two others, rapidly closing the distance. Panic seized us, and we sped away, driving for hours to ensure we weren't pursued. We reported the unsettling incident to the police, but by the time they arrived, the warehouse had been abandoned. Since we hadn't suffered physical harm, they couldn't take further action. The mystery of what these people intended haunted me for a long time. It was a while ago when I was just a kid, maybe around 10 or 11 years old, and my brother, Alex, was a couple of years younger. We were walking home from the bus stop, a short seven-minute journey, when I first sensed that something was off. I couldn't see anything unusual at first, but a sense of unease settled over me like a shroud. My brother and I were the only ones who got off at our stop, and the quietness of the empty street added to the growing tension. As we walked, a beat-up blue and silver truck passed us by without slowing down or stopping. I dismissed it at first, but an unsettling feeling lingered. Alex and I held hands, as our grandmother had always instructed us to do. She constantly reminded me to protect him, my baby brother. For a while, nothing happened. We continued walking, but then, the same truck appeared again, this time approaching us from the opposite direction. It was moving slowly, and my instincts kicked in, telling me we had to run, there was no other choice if we wanted to stay safe. I couldn't explain how I knew, but I did. As we neared a three-way intersection connecting the cul-de-sac road to another side road off the main one, I glanced back and saw the truck creeping towards us. Panic surged within me, and I knew we had to act fast. Passing a house that concealed us from view, I turned to Alex and uttered four words with urgency, no questions, just run. And run we did. Our driveway was about a hundred feet long, lined with bushes and pine trees that separated our home from the neighbors. I pulled Alex into the bushes and whispered for him to stay quiet, promising to explain later. He trembled with fear, tears in his eyes. We watched as the same truck circled the cul-de-sac again before finally coming to a halt right in front of our house. I had to stifle Alex's sobs, fearing that whoever was following us would hear and harm us. I was more concerned for him than myself, as the big sister, it was my responsibility to protect him. The man from the truck, tall, skinny, and disheveled, emerged. His short hair was concealed by a torn baseball cap, and he wore ripped jean shorts and a grimy, green tank top. He entered our yard and scanned the surroundings. Alex and I remained hidden, strategizing how to reach our house safely without alerting the intruder. After an agonizing eternity, the man left, got into his truck, and drove away slowly. We waited a few more minutes to ensure he was gone before I turned to my brother. We need to run, I whispered urgently, on the count of three, we'll head behind that house to the back door, okay? Alex nodded, his eyes filled with fear. As I started counting, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was terribly wrong. But we had to move. I reached three, and we sprinted across our driveway and into our front yard, aiming to circle around the house. However, as soon as we left our hiding spot, I heard it, the revving of an engine. He had seen us, and he had been waiting for us to emerge. Panic surged as the man chased us up our driveway. I grabbed Alex's hand, nearly pulling him along as we rounded the corner of the house. He checked the garage door to see if it was locked while I fumbled for my house key. About 20 feet away from me, 
I saw the garage door was open. I swear, as I entered the house, I glimpsed the man rounding the opposite corner of the house. We made it inside, and I slammed the door shut, locking and dead bolting it. We didn't stop running until we reached the basement, where we screamed our safe word, a word my grandmother had given us for situations just like this. My aunt, who worked the night shift, was sleeping but was awakened by our terrified cries. We told her everything, and she stayed up with us until my grandmother returned home. The police were called, and it marked my first ever interaction with an officer. Unfortunately, the man was never caught. To this day, I have no idea what that man wanted, but I'm certain it wasn't anything good. I'm just grateful my grandmother had instilled the importance of stranger danger in us. I can't help but wonder where my brother and I would be today if she hadn't.